One of the points I was going to start off by making was really that we shouldn't think of Trotskyism as something which is a monolithic ideology. Um, we shouldn't think of the Trotskyist movement as being uh, monolithic. You mentioned, in fact, a number of parties there, the, the American SWP, the DSP in, in Australia, which have, have actually abandoned huge you know, central chunks of Trotskyism, like permanent revolution, and yet hold on to some other aspects of, of Trotskyism. And that, that's actually a much more likely scenario of the type of uh, currents that you're likely to, to meet groups which are very much influenced by Trotskyism, but which are not themselves really recognisably Trotskyist. And I think if Trotsky walked into an SSP meeting, he would certainly walk out again and, and certainly not regard it as living up to what he would think of as a Trotskyist party. I don't think it's really up to us to say, well, these people are the real Trotskyists and these people are fakes. I think it's much better to think of Trotskyism as, as representing a spectrum of views. There's certainly common themes and common elements common theoretical premises and obviously a certain historical approach to, to a number of questions which, which Trotsky's groups tend to have in common. As Paul said, there's enormous difference between them and if you look at the key aspects of what I would consider the key aspects of Trotsky's thoughts, things like permanent revolution, many of the groups that you'll come across don't in, in practice accept Trotsky's own teachings on it. The Socialist Workers Party in Britain doesn't really hold to any real main plank of Trotskyism. It doesn't support permanent revolution, didn't agree with Trotsky's analysis of the Soviet Union, didn't uphold the transitional programme and, and so on and so forth. But would certainly consider itself to be influenced by Trotskyism. And there's a, a kind of almost like a spectrum where you have the so-called orthodox Trotskyists and you have these very kind of heretical Trotskyists, you have very dogmatic Trotskyists and very pragmatic Trotskyists. But in reality, you'll find all sorts of overlapping between these different trends. And so I, I think while these discussions are important, and I think they're important because they reflect certain themes, certain currents, rather than necessarily a finished body of, body of doctrine. If you take Sheridan's new party, he's taken what is quite a dogmatic, historically quite a dogmatic organisation, the Committee for the Workers International, and on the other hand a very pragmatic one, which is the SWP. And he's going to have these two groups within his own party with completely different perspectives on, you know, take Cuba for example, SWP's position, overthrow Cuban state capitalist regime. Sheridan's position is pretty much closer to ours than, than anybody else's and, and the Committee for Workers International takes a supposedly orthodox deformed workers state theory. It's, it's going to be impossible to see how that kind of thing can, can gel but I think that's the nature of a kind of opportunism here which is not to find a party that's based on any common principles, it's, it's really to take advantage of a, of a situation at a given, a given moment. Now I'm not going to um, go much into the, the personality of Trotsky or the history of Trotsky, all these disagreements with Lenin and how you know, we can find a quote from 1904 which uh, proves that Trotsky was wrong and, and that, that was a kind of historically something that happened in the communist movement that's when of course Trotsky was not being slandered as a, an agent of the Gestapo or, or whatever and we have to be honest that that's been a factor in the communist movement's attitude to Trotsky at, at various times. I'm not really going to go down that road except to say that um, clearly we're not dealing with Trotsky and Trotskyism as anything else other than a, a political uh, philosophy. Now, I, I started off earlier with a quote from the transitional programme about the, about the development of capitalism. And we're, we're Trotsky basically said that capitalism had reached its, its final resting point, if you like, in 1938, and we saw how uh, mistaken that was. Essentially, Trotsky's analysis was really to overemphasise the character of, of the world economy and the world market. His difference with Leninism, I think, on, on imperialism is that Lenin stressed very much the very uneven character of imperialism as a system. How it, it's uneven in the sense that there is a, a rivalry between different imperialist powers, an inter, inter-imperialist conflict on the one hand, which is very important. In fact, it was quite crucial for the, the, the Russian Revolution itself because the Russian Revolution took place in the middle of the First World War when the imperialist countries were knocking lumps out of each other. So it provided an opportunity, in fact, for the Russian Revolution to happen. So there's an inter-imperialist rivalry element to Lenin's analysis, which I think is very important. And also Lenin understood that the relationship between nations, as I said earlier on, the question of self-determination of nations oppressed by imperialism, 
was something which had to be taken into into account, that there was still tremendous opportunity for national liberation struggles because of the nature of imperialism as an oppressive force. And that, that led on to, to Lenin and the communist movement taking a, a very different position on national liberation movements, uh, a different analysis of what's often called the national bourgeoisie, whether the capitalists in a particular country can play a progressive role or even a revolutionary role at certain times, whether they can be allies of the working class uh, or whether they are inevitably going to be enemies of the working class and, and the, the peasantry from the beginning. Uh, Lenin pretty much left that open. He said it was a, a matter of, um, de- depending on conditions, that it was possible to make alliances with um, with bourgeois nationalists against imperialism. And he, if you read, for example, what just the other night I was reading something about Lenin's writings on Sun Yat-sen, the great founder of the Chinese revolution, full of praise for Sun Yat-sen as a great founder of uh, democratic ideas in China and anti-imperialism. If you read later on what Trotsky said about Sun Yat-sen, he basically regards the Chinese nationalists as a, a solid reactionary mass, when in fact, historically, there was a lot of contradictions within them. Not to say that the communists always got it right, because they certainly didn't in China, but nonetheless, um, I think that when it comes to Lenin's analysis of imperialism, it's a lot more flexible um, in understanding the contradictions that, that exist and the possibilities that exist for resisting imperialism than, than Trotsky's initial concept of permanent revolution. Now, I'm not going to go into any great detail on that because I wrote a long, well, two articles in Communist Review some time ago about that, spe- specifically in relation to, to Russia and the kind of debates and differences that existed. But I, I think it's important to, to stress a couple of things. Certainly, if we take, for example, the recent revolutionary upheavals in Nepal. Now, certainly Nepal is part of the world economy. It's part of the, the global market. But it's also quite clear that the struggle in Nepal recently wasn't simply between the Nepalese working class and the Nepalese capitalist class or simplistically the Nepalese workers and foreign capital. There were all sorts of other elements which were involved, elements of feudalism, political absolutism, peasant and land issues, agrarian reform and so on. So these, these issues haven't played themselves out on a world scale. There are still many parts of the world where the struggle between labour and capital might be the fundamental struggle, but the primary struggle at any given moment may be about land reform, it may be about national independence, it may be something like Venezuela where it's a question of how a a country can manoeuvre a national democratic revolution in the face of a, a very, very powerful imperialist opponent. I think this is something which really goes to the heart of the difference between Lenin's understanding of how imperialism operates and how uh, Trotsky viewed this, as I said, this world economy. I think he, he overemphasised the, um, the nature of the world economy and tended to underestimate the kind of gaps that appear, the contradictions that appear within that. Now, as I said, I don't want to go into too much detail about the issue of permanent revolution, but it is obviously a very important one. I think it's in short, I think I'd say this. Lenin's concept of the democratic revolution was to build an alliance of forces that would create a momentum that could lead the democratic revolution to pass on into a socialist revolution. A democratic revolution would be uh, a revolution which would bring together forces which would be certainly beyond the working class, certainly the peasantry and possibly other, other forces as well. But he really saw that as a stepping stone towards socialism. Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, on the other hand, tends to assume that there can be no separate stage, that the revolution has to be, the revolution process has to be socialist from, from the outset. And the danger of that, of course, is that you simply don't build up the alliances and the momentum that can actually get you to socialism as, as a stage. Um, it's not a question of separating a democratic and a socialist stage you know, by, um, it's like put it, by putting a, you know, the Great Wall of China in between. They're certainly connected, and especially in the modern world, they're, they're closely connected. But I think Lenin's analysis was really about building this momentum, about building the, the breadth of alliance, about escalating the political struggle against, in the case of colonial powers, or against fascist dictatorships, or or against foreign imperialism, this kind of escalation of a democratic revolution which builds a momentum which can, in certain circumstances, lead into socialist revolution. A very good example 
would be the, the Cuban Revolution, which certainly did not start <coughs> off as a socialist revolution. It started off very much within what appeared to be the confines of a bourgeois revolution. And I think, I can't remember whether it was Fidel Castro or Che Guevara, but one of them made the point that if we called ourselves communists when we were up in the mountains, we would never have got out of them alive. It took the process of the revolution itself to deepen the consciousness and of the Cuban people to, to basically forge the kind of leadership that could take that revolution very rapidly forward from what was a democratic anti-dictatorship struggle to a socialist revolution. I think Cuba's a very, you know, it's a very interesting example and it's one which um, I think causes lots of problems for Trotskyist movement, um, even though the Cuban communists themselves managed to get quite a lot of things wrong in the course of their own strategy. But it does seem to me to be a, a perfect example of the way in which a democratic revolution can build a momentum. And that seems to me to be the, the, the key point about, about Lenin's concept of uninterrupted revolution rather than, than Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. Now, I want to come to the question of um, socialism in one country, which I think um, Simon raised, and the question of the communist movement and Trotsky's analysis of this. Now, obviously, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the European socialist countries was taken as, um, as proof that Trotsky had been completely correct and had always been right on, on the issue. And there's, there's so many quotations from different tendencies, all claiming that Trotsky had analysed it perfectly and predicted it all. That's not an exaggeration. But the fact is that the communist movement did not predict it and didn't, in fact, develop our own analysis of the socialist countries. We either uncritically repeated what the socialist countries themselves said about themselves, which was often hugely optimistic. But really, most importantly, we didn't, as a movement, really develop any coherent theory about the transition from capitalism to socialism and the transition from socialism to, to communism. And uh, we have to be self-critical first and foremost here that um, we inherited a lot of dogmas from, specifically from the Stalin period, but the, it's amazing to see how many of the dogmas lasted through Stalin, Khrushchev, Brezhnev and right up to Gorbachev. So the first point we have to do here is to be absolutely open and say that as a movement, the communist parties did not develop a sufficiently critical and self-critical and coherent analysis of the socialist countries. We didn't really apply Marxism to these societies. And that was... Um, a major error, in fact a criminal error to be, to be blunt. And it's not surprising that so many communists became incredibly disillusioned and disoriented by, by events in, in Eastern Europe at the time. Uh, not, just, you know, not just here, but in, the, in those countries themselves when, when, when state power was lost. So it's not really surprising that the Trotskyist movement in general should regard themselves as having been vindicated by what happened since... Uh, Trotsky's, certainly Trotsky's writings, he predicted any number of uh, possible options about how Soviet society might develop. And some of those actually did turn out to be true. Not all of them were, were, were wrong. I mean, he certainly suggested that some people would, certain careerists would, would use their positions to enrich themselves and try and turn themselves into, turn into capitalists. And that certainly is, is certainly one factor. And, and I, I don't mean to begin this discussion by saying that Trotsky's an unimportant thinker or theoretician. I think people should read Trotsky and in terms of understanding what went wrong in the Soviet Union, certainly Trotsky is a, a pretty helpful guide. However, he's also, I think, rather flawed in, in terms of his analysis and I don't think that we should dump the dogmas which we've inherited from the communist movement in order to embrace dogmas from the Trotskyist movement. One of the, one of the recurring themes I've, I've been making is that Trotsky tended to think of the world economy as pretty much a, a kind of single monolithic factor in politics. He, he regarded the world economy as a, as a factor which affected every country rather than seeing the world economy also as the sum of the different national economies, which is, is true. There's a kind of interaction between a, a world economy, which is quite an abstract thing, and an actual national economy, which is quite real and quite tangible. And that's one of the reasons why he, he certainly believed that it would be impossible to build socialism in one country. I mean, really, Trotsky's arguments can be, I think, divided into really three, three areas. Firstly, he didn't believe that Russia could survive on its own in the face of a conservative Europe. He didn't believe the Russian Revolution could survive. 
He believed that um, there was a possibility of military intervention from outside. That was clearly quite a correct analysis because the imperialist countries did invade Russia. And if you read Lenin in 1918, 1919, during the Civil War and the intervention, you'll find Lenin saying pretty much the same things as Trotsky, that unless the revolution spreads to Germany or at least some of the other capitalist countries, then you know, we're done for. You know, we can't hold out. You'll find some very, very pessimistic arguments there by, by Lenin. So certainly the, the military intervention was a, was a factor. What saved Russia really was, again, the inter-imperialist rivalries, which eventually broke up, and the imperialist countries were not able to have a united front against Russia. So this, this military threat dissipated. As I said, you know, Lenin wasn't um, in complete disagreement with Trotsky on, on, on this issue. Everybody believed that the possibility was that, um, that Russia, Soviet Russia could be crushed by external uh, military intervention. The second reason Trotsky argued might prevent the building of socialism in one country was, was internal counter-revolution. He was, this, this relates to a big, long-standing debate about Trotsky and the peasantry. But I, I think essentially you can say that Trotsky did not have the same approach to the peasantry as Lenin did. Lenin, and especially in his later writings, began to believe that it was possible to have a long-term alliance between the working class and the peasantry in Russia. Trotsky tended to believe that the peasantry would, because the peasantry were a petty bourgeois force, that they would constantly generate small-scale capitalism and that this would be a major factor for counter-revolution. Again, Trotsky wasn't entirely wrong because, of course, one of the factors that uh, ended the NEP and, and led to the collectivisation programme in the, the late 1920s was precisely a counter-revolutionary effort by the Kulaks, by the rich peasants, uh, and their attempts to attack Soviet power. So Trotsky, again, wasn't entirely wrong in, in his analysis. Overall, he tended to take a, a, a different position from Lenin. Lenin believed that there was no necessary antagonism between the working class and the peasantry, and that there were ways, for example, by use of cooperatives and so on, there were ways of bringing the peasantry into a much uh, firmer alliance with, with the working class. But it's an interesting debate as to who was right on that one, whether Lenin would have followed a different course from Stalin, whether he would have accepted that Trotsky was right on this one. It's quite an interesting issue. But in any case, the peasantry were not able to overthrow Soviet power. And um, whatever we think of Stalin, it's quite clear that Stalin didn't backtrack uh, on this issue. And he, you know, his attitude towards the peasantry was certainly not um, one of uh, conciliation or compromise. Now, the other factor is, I suppose, a very basic one. It's just backwardness. The idea that um, the backwardness of Russia simply didn't provide the possibility for a transition to socialism. And Lenin himself, in his later, his later writings in things like On Cooperation, which is quite a, an important article in, in this one, Our Revolution, where he actually comes very, very, very close to the position of socialism in one country. He doesn't say it out, outright, but it's quite clear from the context. He says, if a, definite, if a definite level of culture is required for the building of socialism, although nobody can say just what that definite level of culture is, why cannot we begin by first achieving the prerequisites for that definite level of culture in a revolutionary way, and then, with the aid of the workers and peasants' government and the Soviet system, proceed to overtake the other nations. In effect, Lenin was, was really making the point that it was possible to, to lay the foundations of a socialist society, and that Russia, in fact, despite its backwardness, could, with the correct policies, lay foundation after foundation to make um, a socialist society possible. Now, there's a big debate, which I'm not going to even go into, about the victory of socialism, the final victory of socialism, and different definitions that Trotsky and Stalin argued about incessantly about what was meant by the building of socialism. I think Lenin here is talking about the victory of a socialist economy, not just the victory of a, a workers and peasants state over the capitalist class. That's the beginning of the socialist revolution. But the beginnings of a socialist economy uh, which um, have become consolidated. Uh, I think that is Lenin's definition here and I think that's a perfectly legitimate one. But I want to take up one aspect of, of Trotsky's discussion about socialism because it really is a very important one because it, it's the fundamental question of the definition of what socialism is, the, the lower phase of communism. I'm going to quote from an, an article, pamphlet actually, produced by 
by the IMG, a guy called Phil Hearst, which was written a number of, number of years ago. He said, um, Trotskyists, socialism is defined as that stage characterised by the abolition of the state and commodity production. And Trotsky said more or less the same thing himself. He said, the socialist society will live its life without a party, just as it will live without a state. Now, certainly, if you read Lenin, Lenin's State and Revolution, he makes it quite clear that a state will continue to exist under socialism, and that the state only begins to wither away under, under full communism. And there seems to be a confusion here, and it's perhaps not entirely Trotsky's fault, because there was no blueprint left behind by anybody, by Marx or Engels or Lenin, about how the transition would happen. But it, it's quite clear that Trotsky's definition of socialism is quite different from Lenin's. Lenin clearly suggests that there will continue to be a state under socialism, and in fact the state won't really wither away until you achieve full-scale communism. Trotsky here is, is actually bringing in characteristics of full, full communism into the lower stage of communism. There's a confusion there. So, you know, even with the best world, world in the world, clearly you couldn't have socialism in one country using the, the definition that, that, that Trotsky offered here. And it's a very, very confusing debate, I think. If you pick up Stalin, and if you read through Stalin's debates, and you read Trotsky, and you find all these differing definitions, it's quite clear that there isn't clear definition which is accepted across the board. They're using different terms. Um, you can spend hours going through Trotsky and Stalin in th these kind of debates at that time. I'm not sure how much good will come of it, but certainly it's there if you're, if you're very interested in following it up. But I think there clearly is a, a difference in definition between Lenin and Trotsky on, on what socialism was. I think I'd go further and also say it's quite clear that later on Stalin himself also redefined what socialism and, and communism was. He went beyond the arguments that um, Lenin left here, even arguing that um, it was possible to build communism in one country. He, he meant full, full communism. That's an idea that he, that he introduced. And that was a, an idea which the Soviet Communist Party kept for many, many years under Khrushchev. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the great anti-Stalin Khrushchev nonetheless took on the idea and said the Soviet people will, will, live on, will achieve communism by 1980. You know, that was written into the party programme. So this was a, and this is the point I'm trying to make about how much, how much we've inherited from the Stalin period, and we haven't cleaned ourselves out on, on this issue. We've, we've got a lot of dogmas that we've inherited from all sorts of different directions, and it's perhaps by going back to Lenin and back to Marx that we can actually help to kind of reassess how right or how wrong we were on a whole number, whole number of issues. And certainly we should reread Stalin and we should read Trotsky to get a flavour of the kind of debates that were, that were there. But I think another final point on, on this question of Stalinism and socialism in one country. Trotsky developed uh, another couple of theories which he applied to Soviet society, which he borrowed from the experience of the French Revolution. And he talked about how Stalin and Stalin's bureaucratic regime was Bonapartist. By this he meant that the bureaucracy was in some way kind of hovering above the class struggle in society. It was balancing itself between... The, the rich peasantry on the one hand and the working class on the other. When Stalin launched the collectivisation programme, and it became quite obvious that he wasn't balancing at all, he was, you know, he was sitting on the rich peasantry, certainly not balancing on them. Trotsky shifted his definition of Bonapartism from being something which was internal to something which was external. He then began to argue that Stalin was still a Bonapartist regime, it was still balancing, but this time it was balancing between the Soviet state and international imperialism, that there was some kind of balancing act going on. And this idea of um, Bonapartism is, is something which is a real favourite of the Committee for the Workers International. They use it very, very widely. And um, their leader, Peter Taff, writing about the Chinese Revolution, he said... Um, Mao Zedong balanced between different sections of society, the peasantry, the working class and sections of the capitalists, and gradually expropriated landlordism and capitalism. Thus, the main lines of Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution were vindicated here, although in a caricatured form. So, you know, Trotsky's right even when, you know, even when he's wrong. Nevertheless, a social revolution had been carried through. The elimination of landlordism and capitalism had taken place. This was only possible because of the peculiar relationship of world forces both within China and internationally. A Bonapartist elite resting in a peasant army was able to balance between the classes 
and preside over a social revolution. Now, that is absolute nonsense. A social revolution does not involve balancing between classes. It means completely transforming the relationship between classes. It's absolutely impossible to imagine that uh, you can talk about Bonapartism, something which is balancing between different social forces, when in fact what the Chinese communists were doing was transforming their country, both um, in terms of agrarian reform and, and gradually into the, uh, the elimination of the capitalist sectors of, of their economy. It simply does not make sense to use these kind of concepts. So there's some major problems within the theoretical framework of Trotskyism in, in trying to explain the development of socialist revolutions, not just in, in Russia but also in China.